First up, we're looking for approval of the agenda. So moved. Motion and support. Any changes or additions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Public comment? Hello, public. Anybody with a comment? Hearing none, public comment is closed. Moving on to the minutes of the August 12th meeting. Motion and support. Any changes or corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Takes us to appointments. We have two committees. I saw no applicants. Uh, unless there's a nomination from the floor and just a reminder for commissioners to try and seek out uh, applicants from your elected boards in your areas or your constituents in your areas uh, that takes us down to front of the court budget adjustment or amendment Cecilia good morning good morning so I am here for the front of the court budget amendment. Um, when the fiscal 19 budget was uh, uh, put together, they did, um, the transfers out for debt service for the pension bonds and also de um, transfers out for retiree health wasn't budgeted. So this amendment is correcting that. Is there any questions? Commissioners, any questions of Cecilia? <laughs> so the net increase is still your 309 215? Um, yes, that's going to be uh, against our planned f use of uh, fund balance. So, yes. Okay, we'd be looking for a motion if there are no questions. So motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Thank you, Cecilia. Okay, thank you. Front of the court, semi annual report. Morning, sir. Good morning. Um, okay. So talking a little bit about our 2016 improvement goals, those were the goals that were established uh, when I started. Um, we are steadily showing increases in appointments with our caseworkers and enforcement staff. So that primary goal was to increase the accessibility to, from our clients to our staff um, and reducing barriers. So that um, the appointments are if somebody calls up and really just needs to talk to their caseworker, doesn't understand what's going on with their case, they're scheduled an appointment. And that phone appointment, um, so they don't have to take off time work to come into the office, can just um, get a phone call from our office within 48 hours. So within two days, they're getting a phone call back to get their problem resolved. We do this um, as opposed to a direct transfer or a call directly to our caseworkers because nine times out of ten the questions that they have are very case specific and it requires us to take a look at the case, do research, make sure we have the information correct. So to ask off the fly or to, to just ask the question right away, we then have to say, well, we got to do some research to give you the answer so then we're going to have to call you back. So that's why we do that. Um, parenting time complaints continue to decline, which is a good thing. That means that our parents are getting access to their children. Um, part of that goal was to improve the number or the amount of time it took to respond to the parenting time complaints. In the past, it was taking quite a long time to get to those, and now they have to be responded to within five days. Um, so that decreases. In, and our caseworkers are fantastic. They've been doing them within a couple of days. They do the research, they find out if it's a valid complaint, and they get a response out right away so that kids aren't going without um, the other parent for any length of time. Uh, support reviews, we're showing a steady increase with our support reviews from um, 667 to 943 in the last year, and we're on track to still do um, that same, a little less this year, but we still have a few projects yet to do. Um, so again, we're looking at right-sizing orders, making sure that people in real time have the support orders that are charging the right amount so that when if somebody loses their job or becomes underemployed or goes to jail or prison for any length of time, we're immediately getting those orders right-sized so that we're not just racking up debt for these parents that they can never collect. Sarah, can I interject a question? Yes. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Just to be clear, the numbers that you have, for instance, in Block 1, the 2018 numbers, for instance, are the entire year, and the other numbers for now are just up till June. Correct. Obviously. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Um, so going into number two, these are the performance incentives. This is the federal monies um, and our performance with those uh, 
goals that the feds have set for us and we receive federal incentive monies based on our performance with those. Um, I'm really excited to report that the percent change, the increase, this is the first time in the 10 years that I've worked here that those have all been up. So um, I'm very proud of my staff for all rowing the boat in the same direction and getting us um, improvement in that area because everybody's working very hard to improve in that area. Um, so in the first column where it says support order percentage and then the 82% in parentheses, that's the goal from the state. That's what they want us to be at. And you can see where we're at and how much we improved from this point last year. Um, I'm also slightly competitive, so I did put in some other counties in there to show um, how we stand in, um, around like-sized counties as well as neighboring counties so that we have a good idea of not only how we're doing for the state goal, but how we're doing with our local um, communities. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, good morning. I'm morning. looking at these percentages. I mean, support order percentage, 82%. I don't understand. The 82% of what? Why isn't it 100%? Sure. Um, so the support order percentage, the 82%, um, for that particular goal is the number of cases that we have open in the given year that we have attached a support order to. So these are brand new cases where people are needing their support or, or support established against the other parent. Um, so we work with the prosecutor's office to get those set up. Um, sometimes those take longer than a year or depending on the measurement of when it looks in real time, it's not always 100% because sometimes we don't know who the other parent is, we need, still need to serve them, we need to do DNA testing, we need to locate them sometimes, so it's not always going to be 100%. So this tells me that of the support orders that you've received this year, 82% of them, 82 of them have been resolved? Yes. Well, 81.3, so 82% is the goal for the state, and then the first column, 81.3, that means that we've we've established support orders on 81% of the cases that have come in for this fiscal year. Okay. So there's still roughly 20% that we're still either locating the other parents on, um, trying to establish an order on, trying to get the DNA testing, things like that done. Okay, so if we go to the bottom row, <coughs> the arrears case, uh, Percent of this, te this tells me that of the arrears cases you've received, this year, two-thirds of them you've resolved, and one-third you have not? Sort of. Um, it's a cumulative uh, collection item, so I, each year it starts back at zero. So they look at every case that we have that has back child support or arrears owing on it. And every time we collect on a case that has arrears, it gets another tick on that amount. So that number grows as the year's, year goes on. So. Um, as an example, it's usually 20% within the first month when it starts over again, and then it builds because we collect current support first, of course, and then we collect towards the back child support. Um, and as you can imagine, we have a good population of clients that are in our local prison system, so they owe quite a bit of back child support, and we don't collect on that because they have no means to pay. So our number typically is not very high on that, but we do collect on the cases that are collectible. Okay, so left column, the, <clears throat> the state expectations are one-third of these cases are not resolved. Yes. Okay, yep. thank you. Mm -hmm. The current support percentage, which is the one above it, that's the amount of current charge that's collected. So if support is $100 a month, are we collecting the full $100 or are we collecting a portion of it at any given time? And the 4D paternity establishment, that's what um, is showing on the order that the, da the dad has been established on the case as being the, the paternal father. The contract performance standards on number three, that is the new uh, performance standards that the state has now given us in order to have our 4D contract, which also does the two-thirds funding for our contract. That, um, those are the measurements they now have given us. Um, these are new, so they have given us a year to work with them to understand what they're measuring. Um, and as you can see, the goal for the state is 75%, and we are far exceeding that. I will say to their credit, 
They provide us with fantastic reports that spell out specifically which cases need to be worked to make sure that we pass that, um, that measurement. So it's a lot easier for my staff to find those cases, work them, make sure they're getting the attention they need. In the number two column, it's more of a moving target, and that's something that we're working on with the feds to try to get better reporting to be able to pin down and identify the cases that need to be worked on those. Um, the last piece that I wanted to touch on is that because these improvement goals have been since 2016, I am working with uh, my management staff to develop a new three-year strategic plan for our office. Um, so I hope to be able to present that to you next time I'm in front of you. I know namely one of our high priority items is to get through our policy handbook manual. Um, we have some policies in there that are quite dated. Um, so we're going to be going through those and making sure that they're up to date. Um, and there's some bigger changes that are coming through the state uh, that's going to redefine some of our positions and what our staff are going to be able to do for clients, which is going to be pretty exciting stuff. So I'm happy to see that that's coming. Thanks, sir. Commissioners, any other questions for Sarah? Bill. Just a comment. You're doing a, a nice job down there. Thank you. I have fortunately been there before years ago, and it was a mess. And uh, I'm impressed with what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. I really appreciate that. Bird down there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Takes us to the sheriff under Sheriff Cool. Good morning. Good morning. Insert USB here. You guys have got things tricky on me here. <clears throat> uh, as far as our average daily population, it continues to be fairly steady. Uh, we've not seen a significant change one way or another. It has climbed slightly over the past couple years, uh, but again, that's a smoothing over the whole year, taking our total population uh, divisible by the number of uh, days in the year, number of inmates, etc. cetera. Um, intakes, again, uh, rising a little bit, um, not significant. Females continue to be uh, very high. Uh, we continue to have a problem with that. Um, as the statute goes, it does not identify overcrowding as a gender specific uh, type of situation is just total population where at Wesley Street which is the only place we can house females we continue to see an inordinate amount of females um, sentenced to the county jail to the point where we're having to make a, a number of arrangements and move people around so far we've been able to accomplish that uh, district court has been uh, very accommodating for us as far as uh, when we reach a very high number, being able to um, get some, some of those people out on some type of supervised release or if they're close to the end of their sentence, et cetera. So we've been in close contact with district court. <coughs> Cell searches, again, um, we're in a day and age now where, where contraband is um, kind of an ever-present thing, especially with the uh, presence of addictive drugs and opiates and things like that. So we've been a little aggressive over the last couple of years in our cell searches. Um, <coughs> we continue to have a good number of inmates participating in the JPS high school completion courses. Um, this is not a GED again. We've talked about it many times. This is actual high school diploma. So we're seeing a good number of inmates who, who have the eligibility and who have the background, don't need to be caught up uh, a ton, being able to take uh, kind of participation in these classes and earn their high school diploma. <clears throat> Medical services um, continues to be kind of a uh, touchy point for us. We have obviously a frail population and um, really we have just a handful of people who are really in very dire need of very severe uh, medical attention that, that kind of drives some of these numbers and the budgetary figures up. But uh, nurse staff uh, doing very well in handling all those and then CMH, CMH uh, our, our worker through Lifeways has been uh, a very positive addition to our staff and to the actual county jail spending a lot of time doing the intake sitting down with the inmates etc so surely uh and we now have another individual there has been a, a, a godsend for us as far as being able to address some of those mental health issues <coughs> again um <coughs> surely has really been knocking it out as far as seeing inmates and getting uh getting them services and kind of that warm handoff to the community once they are eligible for release from the county jail about continuing their services once they're outside the jail um, 
Again, Vivitrol for the opioid addictions, uh, we we've have an agreement with Centers for Family Health because really Vivitrol is a long suspending drug in your system to help fight the uh, cravings of opioid addictions. But the problem is it's a, it has to be a long-term thing where they follow up. And obviously once they're outside the county jail, we don't have, uh, you know, authority over them anymore nor do we have supervision of them so we have an agreement with the centers for family health where we can set this program up with them and once we release they can go back there for their um, injections and keep on that vivitrol drug to hopefully fight a return to the opioid addiction and prevent them from being drawn back into that Wayne State University's um, stepping up for mental health. Uh, again, we're, we're deeply involved in that. Um, this was a grant that came to us through uh, the Department of Community Health and Wayne State University. Lifeways is a very integral partner for that with us. And uh, really the, the initiation of that project was to screen out these incoming inmates to find out what our problem actually was here in Jackson County. And I'm, I'm sad to say that uh, we have a much higher percentage than they expected of um, individuals suffering from mental health that was either undiagnosed or previously not um, determined and coupled with that substance abuse and drug addiction is the next big um, kind of interplayer with that so that screening period is done and now we're in the process of um, developing some guidelines where they can have kind of a, a deep involved treatment of these individuals with with mental health crises and this is again we're looking at people who are previously undiagnosed uh, lifeways obviously they're there in our jail they know their clients but we have a lot of people coming in who maybe have seen another mental health provider where they're not on lifeways radar but the goal is to identify these people connect them with services and then again uh, the warm handoff once they're released from the county jail to get them into services because it doesn't do any good just to kick them out on the street um, and have them regress right back to where they were and then the uh, jail or the uh, kitchen project at Wesley Street was uh, completed um, that was out of capital improvement funds that got moved up one year uh, because of the uh, very uh, the, the the condition in the kitchen was deteriorating very fast and it presented a very um, high safety uh, risk to the uh, food service employees. Chris, yes, I think uh, Commissioner Duckham has a question. Go right ahead. Thank you, sir. The uh, Wayne State program, stepping program, uh, says here twenty eight percent of the people screened have tested or indicated they have mental health issues. <coughs> What, what happens to them afterwards? Did I miss it or? You know, so what happens is um, once they are identified that they are maybe suffering from some type of mental health issues and they're previously undiagnosed. So the 28% is going to be people who have not, they don't have any kind of record with LifeWays they're not seeing or at least that we can't find where they've seen some other type of CMH provider, things like that. So what's going to happen there is um, this this Wayne State project, it really is in coordination with LifeWays. We're just kind of opening the facility and accommodating. What they're going to do is they're going to extend those services to those individuals that are um, identified. They're going to set them up with treatment programs through LifeWays. And then once they are released, they're going to develop a continuation of the plan for them about where they can go. Now, if they're from outside the area, which is not, uh, not a lot of people, but we do have that occasionally, uh, we will coordinate with those mental health providers where those people are from, assuming they're going back to that area so they have a treatment plan. The whole goal is um, to find those people that weren't diagnosed, that we can tell either by the intake or by their observations or by um, surely the clinician's observations and evaluation that they're suffering from a mental health crisis, create a treatment plan, start them on that treatment plan rather than their county jail, and then release them out so they hopefully uh, find that treatment program and continue on with it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Video visitation. Um, this was a project that was previously uh, approved by the Board of Commissioners, I think about a year and a half ago, in probably fiscal year 2017. It took a while to get going. We had some technological challenges, but it is going. It provides uh, a, a new revenue avenue for us. Um, it also increases the amount of visits and the visit times. Um, increases the uh, number of hours in a day the inmates can visit and then of course for the safety of the guards it reduces inmates visits because they can do it right from the uh, kiosk in their holding unit or in their holding tank um, <clears throat> the tablet program is still something that we had talked about in the past uh, that's still on the horizon again we had put that on the shelf to get the video visitation fully up and running uh, that took a little longer than we had hoped for but again um, like we had talked about within the tablet program this is not wide open um, there's only a number of things that they can get through the tablets most of it is reading material books music etc uh, it's not a wide open uh, gateway to the world wide web um, they are locked down and they're all owned by the 
The uh, inmate calling service, none of them are ours, so if they are damaged, that's on the inmate calling service, not on the county. Um, again, we continue to try to be aggressive with parole billings and diverted felon billings with the Department of Corrections, um, as I discussed with Cecilia prior. Uh, this year that the Department of Corrections is not necessarily always timely in those but we do uh, make an aggressive effort to get those and get those within our fiscal year so we can be fully um, accounted for within our county budget on the patrol side um, again dispatch incidents is just a little under 14,000 uh, a little bit of a rise but not significant uh, we continue to issue a significant amount of um, purchase permits for firearms and then again, we have a lot of freedom of information requests that come just through our front office, and we coordinate closely with uh, Joni and Delane uh, when they receive them online to get those FOIA requests filled and granted back to the requester. <clears throat> those are the numbers there, uh, 1,000 arrests, a little over 1,000, um, 4,400 traffic stops, and uh, OWIs Chris. and citations. Yes. Positive. I'm, am I reading this right? There were 4,400 traffic stops, but of that, only 1,000 citations were issued. Is that correct? That's correct. So the traffic stop number can include a couple different things, but for the most part, those are going to be traffic violations, yes. And 11 guns seized. <clears throat> These are unlawful guns. These are not... Uh, somebody um, you know carrying without a permit etc these are uh, your your traditional carrying a concealed weapon that's that's unlawful <clears throat> we had our awards banquet again this year um, there you see the two uh, deputies of the year for patrol and for the corrections division um, we have uh, <clears throat> excuse me Pedro Peraza for the corrections officer of the year and Justin Sawyer who is uh, the patrol deputy of the year Honor Guard participated in the Washington, D.C. Memorial. Um, that was uh, a, a nice trip for them to be able to uh, be invited to participate in that. And again, the Honor Guard has presented the colors at both the races this year. Um, they continue to be asked to a number of events to do the presentation of colors um, or ceremonies before the events begin. <clears throat> Marine Patrol, we've wrapped up the season. Um, we have fortunately had a, a fairly safe summer. Um, we have assisted uh, out, outside county area agencies and also the city of Jackson on a couple dive recoveries. Um, but again, so far we've had a fairly successful and safe season on our county waterways. Um, again, two of the school liaison deputies are put into the Marine budget to draw off of the Marine grant fund while their schools are not in session. And um, we have pretty much hit all the county lakes this year, um, spending a, a larger number of time on the more traffic lakes like Clark, um, Farwell, uh, Wampler's Portage, et cetera, where you have a lot, a lot of high boating activity. <clears throat> We put some uh, data in here from our school deputies. This is again for the uh, first part of the school year, so from January 1 till when school wrapped up about June 10th or so roughly for Jackson County. Um, you can see the number of complaints, both criminal and non-criminal, um, truancy issues, um, actual police reports filed, uh, train sessions that we did for staff. This usually revolves around active shooter stuff or, or how to respond to violent or active incidents. Um, and then obviously the number of school safety drills that within our schools that we help facilitate. <clears throat> some of the major incidences this year um, <clears throat> you can see there uh, obviously we had a train strike a pedestrian uh, the traffic investigation team responded out there and uh, assisted and conducted that investigation um, again <clears throat> we had the farming accident up on territorial road which is a very unfortunate situation um, where we responded to and the gentleman suffered uh, fatal injuries from that accident as he became tangled in a farm implement <clears throat> We had a shooting on uh, Summit Township. Um, this is at East South and East South and Sunnyside Court. Uh, we were able to recover the evidence and obviously arrest the shooter. Fortunately, um, fortunately there were no injuries, um, and the intended target was uh, was missed in this situation. And then, unfortunately, we have the shooting of Deputy Carter that happened on April 17th. Um, <clears throat> They were searching a home for a subject who had broken into the home and, and previously committed a domestic violence act against the uh, occupant of the house and lied in wait for Deputy Carter um, and shot him multiple times. The uh, suspect ended up taking his own life. Deputy Carter continues to convalesce and recover from his injuries. Um, it uh, is unclear what his timetable is. 
And then you probably saw this one. We thought we'd put it in here just because it's kind of funny. Uh, recovered a um, small alligator from a swampy area down in Hanover Township. Uh, Deputy Bonson was able to take custody of the alligator and turn it over to Animal Control where they kindly accepted it back into the shelter and uh, uh, I'm assuming um, did what they needed to do as far as returning that to a more appropriate area. <coughs> Mounted Division, again, they continue to be a very integral part of this department. Uh, I don't think we can make things like the fair and the fireworks happen without them. Uh, they're a very visible presence and, and a great assist to us, especially when we have search and rescue type of functions uh, because of their ability with their horses. Uh, they have logged about 800 hours, and then we have the reserves who have logged just under 500 hours. Again, a lot of this is the community events that go on around this county that we need the extra manpower for that we would not have all those people for. Yes, sir. Oh, I have the pleasure of knowing quite a few of the individuals on the Mounted Division. Good. And having spoken with them, several of them out at the fair, they've had some requests in for purchase of equipment, uh, purchase of tack for their animals. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, they've been just providing all this themselves. They were looking to get some sheriff's department to fund some of that. Has anything moved on those requests? Well, so we do we do not have a budget for the Mounted Division. Um, generally, we address their needs as they bring them forward to us. Uh, back about a month and a half ago, uh, maybe two months ago, they made a request for about fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars in equipment. Uh, mainly, it was things like saddlebags, tack gear, some various other things. Uh, we had them order them. Um, they were supplied those items. And each year I meet with them, they have not presented me with any additional requests. So we take it as, as the uh, time kind of comes. Um, I know that Captain Clark has been dealing with some difficulties in his uh, personal life, so I'm, I'm going to probably chalk that up to that. But uh, they have not submitted any further requests. The initial round of requests they gave me back um, May, June, maybe it was a little earlier than that. We accommodated those and got those ordered and um, fulfilled. And then each year they kind of bring up to me what they might need. Uh, obviously, it is a large financial burden upon them um, horses transporting the horses feed things like that so uh, we try to accommodate their needs each year and, and kind of see what equipment they have what what equipment they need they did have some previous unused equipment um, because there have been a couple members who had left the team maybe didn't have quite all the equipment um, it wasn't used or hadn't been used significantly so they kind of redistributed that out and addressed some of the the more downtrodden equipment and then we bought them some new additional stuff so yeah if they have additional needs um, they should bring that forward to me and then we'll try to accommodate those as the budget year close out and see where we're at financially thank you you're welcome <clears throat> Jane, you can see the figures there uh, obviously we we have a little bit of a swing in our seizures and what I'd call the preferred drug, but I wouldn't read a whole lot into that, only because heroin by its um, quantity is far more lethal in smaller quantities. So you're, you're going to seize a smaller amount of heroin, but it has a more lethality than maybe a, a larger amount of um, meth or cocaine. But we are seeing a resurgence or a rise in methamphetamines and methamphetamines abuse. Um, I will not say that the problem of heroin and opioids is, is by far gone, but um, we're starting to see the trend of methamphetamines climb back up there as far as people in possession of it, uh, manufacturing small or one-pot methods, etc. <clears throat> yes. I think on one of your previous slides, um, yeah, guns seized were 11, and JNET, so it appears that all of the guns seized were related to JNET and drug confiscations? No. JNET seizures or JNET seizures alone. Our patrol and our violent crime squad, which I'll get to in just a minute, they've seized 11 guns on our own. JNET has seized 11 additional guns. Those numbers are not... Um, all right, so just a coincidence, those numbers are the same. That's correct. Okay. And, and Chris, that slide is all the JNET investigation work on that slide, correct? That's correct. Thanks. Thank you for clarifying that. <clears throat> Uh, we have some large-scale cases in here from Jana. I won't read those verbatim. You guys can uh, look those over, but um, we obviously Janet continues to be after the large-scale dealers or the large-scale distribution chains and uh, trying to put an end to those or at least disrupt those. And we have a few of those in there that you can read through if you want. But um, again, 
continues to be a problem in our community, one of the biggest scourges in our community, and is related to a lot of other things. Uh, the, the drug trade and drug abuse is directly re related back to a lot of property crimes. <clears throat> so back in uh, 2018, we were asked by the city of Jackson to help participate in basically a task force to drive down or identify and arrest uh, the individuals responsible for the violent crime. We have a deputy staff just exclusively to the city of Jackson, and that deputy partners with a public safety officer from Blackman Township and a trooper from the state police post, and they are overseen by a city of Jackson sergeant. And all these individuals do is they look for these individuals that are causing the violent uh, criminal acts, the shootings, and they are focusing on building investigations towards those individuals. They are keeping a profile of these violent crime groups and trying to make inroads, arrests, seizures, etc. And obviously you can see these, these are just the Violent Crimes Task Force, but 148 arrests, um, a little under 1,000 traffic stops, uh, 20 search warrants, and 16 guns. So if you start adding those numbers up, 11, 11, and 16, that's a lot of illicit guns were taken off the street. Um, and a lot of these are being used in these open air shootings or middle of the day shootings that we're having in the city of Jackson. So we continue to try to be a good partner with the city of Jackson police, work with them to aggressively drive down some of this violence that we're seeing in the city. <clears throat> and yes. I notice in a lot of the newspaper reports we must have a lot of bad shooters because people seem to be getting hit in the legs all the time. Is there a significance, a significant reason? Is that a message or we just got bad aim? I think it could be a combination. Um, I think it could be a, a message as far as um, the, the wounding of the individual. Uh, but a lot of these are... Uh, I guess what I would refer to as drive-by shootings. Um, so they're basically uh, opening up and, and spraying an individual, a house, a car, etc. cetera. Um, the danger in that becomes that we're having a lot of dwellings that are hit, a lot of cars that are hit. Uh, it's only gonna be a matter of time before we have an innocent bystander that catches a stray bullet. Um, I would not want to comment whether we have bad shooters or not. I think it's unfortunate that we're having this type of gunplay right here on our city streets right in the right. middle of the day. Uh, but it's, it's probably a couple of those things combined together and um, perhaps it's, it's just a simple firing of a gun at another individual to send a message that they have somehow been wronged by this individual. Gotcha. All right. That's what I was wondering. Thank you. Chris, I've just got one question. It was back on the CM, CMH presence uh, at the jail. Uh, that partnership seems to be working well, but uh, when an officer brings an arrestee in, it's kind of common knowledge on the street. I can say it because the press isn't here, but that uh, the arrestee claims to be suicidal and it either delays things or gets them a ride to the hospital where they're sometimes left or the officer has to wait with them. Is there any assessment that's ever done at the jail if somebody is arrested uh, and brought in and claims to be suicidal where they're assessed at the jail and would not have to make that trip to the hospital? Well, and that's the one thing that we need to um, get out of the, the confusion of, or I guess um, the mindset that the CMH worker is not there to render immediate aid for those individuals that claim to be suicidal. I understand it might be a convenience for some individuals and for some officers. It's a convenience for us too, or it's an inconvenience for us too, as far as our deputies coming off the street. But you cannot uh, substitute the mental health intervention, which is basically uh, a, a drawn out process to understand what, are, what services have you received, what kind of services um, can we provide you, versus the immediate medical need of suicidal tendencies. Uh, the, the courts have been very clear that those two things um, are not interchangeable. You cannot circumvent a uh, medical care facility like the hospital's treatment at the emergency department for somebody who might be suicidal um, versus the CMH worker. I know that everyone would like to bring us the inmates and if they claim suicidal, that's fine, drop them off on us, but that's not gonna work. That, that, that uh, opens the county up to a significant amount of liability. They have to be seen by a medical professional. They have to be seen by the emergency department or as Lifeways gets this new program up and running um, at, at the facility up on Lifeways, which is basically a crisis center, um, that will speed the process up. But those two things cannot be substituted for one another. They have to receive treatment and they have to receive clearance to know that they're, they're okay to be lodged at the county jail. If that an individual comes in and, and uh, kills himself or inflicts harm to himself, it's going to be the county on the hook because we did not render the appropriate treatment or require the appropriate treatment to be rendered for him or her. 
So you don't think we'll ever be in a position, and it sounds like we're heading to the point where we maybe even now can drop off somebody to LifeWays for an assessment and we leave them there, and you don't think we'll ever be at the point where we could have that LifeWays person at the jail to do that same assessment? I wouldn't say we'll never be at that point. Um, I think right now that crisis r and services versus alignment of mental health services, which is what CMH is there for, and, and treatment of people that are in crisis within the county jail, um, those two things are, are need to be independent of one another right now. Do we get to a point in the future where there's some type of crisis r and r representative at the county jail? Yeah, we might, um, but again, those two treatment paths or those two treatment programs are separate and, and, and entirely um, independent of one another and provide different things. You know, we're looking at long-term alignment of resources, treatment programs, aligning of treatment once the individual is released from the county jail um, versus kind of an immediate uh, crisis type of situation. So, you know, really the hope is once the crisis center gets up, up and running at the um, lifeways that that situation will be resolved they're talking about a very short time frame in and out um, you know they're, they're targeting something like a 30 minute window as far as like evaluation identification and then obviously what they find there will dictate where they move and, and, and how that goes but uh, if the need was there yeah I can see that um, conversation being bridged with with uh, LifeWays as far as putting a crisis type of person um, within the county jail just will, would really depend on what is the true need. That's obviously going to be a lot of it. And dollars, of course. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions? Darius. Good morning. Good morning. I have just, just a couple of quick questions for sure. you. Um, in, the one of your, in the previous slide you had mentioned, you had talked about the um, doctor's visits, nurse's visits, etc. Um, are those doctors coming from Allegiance or are they contracted in? I, I think you answered this before and if you did I apologize. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, so the doctors are with our medical contract provider, Advanced Correctional Healthcare. Uh, but if, they, they, if that individual needs treatment outside the facility, uh, we use all of Henry Ford systems, okay. uh, whether it be Jackson Radiology, whether it be the ED department, or whether it be some type of follow-up service. But just by the nature of the fact that we contract with Advanced Correctional Health Care for the health care services, that is entirely theirs to handle. Uh, they have a doctor just dedicated to our jail that is employed by ACH. He has a very close working relationship with Henry Ford because obviously he has to draft orders if someone needs uh, some type of procedure. So he has gotten very well known as far as his interactions with the Henry Ford Health Systems and things like that. Okay. Um, and then you also mentioned the uh, uh, the screens that we have in the visit for visitation as a source of revenue. That's correct. Um, how much revenue are you approximately are you seeing in there? Well, so the fiscal number just those revenues actually just started coming in about a month ago, and and the agreement with that plan was is that. We were not going to pay, we as the county, we're not going to pay any upfront cost to install this video visitation system, uh, that the phone provider was going to do it. And out of, from the time that we signed the contract until basically a percentage of their install fees were paid, they would use that to offset their capital investment and then we began to see revenue. So okay. our July check that came in uh, for commissions was actually the first check that we saw that actually had commissions on it because the capital investment um, is obviously paid by them. So we'll be watching that for the last six months of this year to see what that actually revenue impact is um, and how we're able to offset any cuts that we sustained. I see. Okay. Um, and then the, the JNET numbers that you reported? Yes. Um, are you seeing any difference between this year and last year at all? Well, not a significant difference, but a lot of it becomes, too, what their availability of, of manpower is. And then also, because JNET, by its very nature, is a long-term, large-scale investigation, um, they have got their people into probably three or four very large-scale operations that involve federal authorities. So that's going to take their time away from, from street investigations. So you will see a drop in that, but kind of the devil's in the details. So they continue to be fairly consistent. The manpower has been fairly consistent. But again, they're involved in those long-term deals. So they may, they may spend a month, two months, three months on one investigation, and you'll see kind of a, a decline in the numbers. But that's because they're deploying all the resources to this long-term, large-scale investigation. Okay. And then my, my last question for you is, how are the vehicles running? I'm sorry? How are the vehicles running? Vehicles are running good. We're keeping them all on the road, except for one uh, that was involved in a, a traffic accident a few months ago where someone ran a stop sign, um, and, and that vehicle was totaled out. Uh, but 
uh, at the end of the day, that's just kind of the price of doing business. And thankfully, that car was hundred and some thousand miles on it. So we'll just wait on that car and replace it the next cycle. Okay. All right. Thank if you. If the board approves, of course. Thank you. I have nothing further. Okay. Any other questions <coughs> from commissioners? Hearing none, thank you, Under Sheriff. Thank you. Takes us to the airport semi annual report. Juan, good morning. Morning, commissioners. Um, our semi-annual report: the uh, the county hangars are 100% occupied. They continue to be 100% occupied, and we have a waiting list. So that's something to be uh, looking for in the future: is the uh, need to build in more hangars, or uh, having a private individual develop part of the hangar construction at the airport. The uh, the the historically high number of annual operations for the airport was about 15 years ago, and it was 53,000, roughly, operations a year. We're looking to uh, break 44,000 this year, and that's, uh, it's not great, but it's better than it's been in the past. In 2017, we saw a low of 37,000. The, uh, the fuel sales continue to lag behind. That's primarily because of the changing picture in aviation in the United States, where we're having more and more business aviation operations and less of a hobby operations. Uh, case in point for the airport to date, we've only had about slightly over 300 corporate operations, but that has brought in most of the fuel revenue for the airport. And our fuel flowage fees are eight cents per gallon, which is a little on the low side. So we're right now conducting a survey to determine if that's something that needs to be increased in the future. The uh, August of uh, 2019 terminal apron project, there were some issues with the uh, design of the uh, apron and the, uh, we had to cancel the initial bid, redesign the apron and then rebid it, and that caused the apron project to be delayed. So right now we're looking at May of 2020. This is uh, 2019 discretionary funds, federal discretionary funds, and the low bid came in at uh, just under 2.9 million. That's 90% uh, federal, 5% state, and 5% uh, local. This was already budgeted for the uh, 2019 year, and it will uh, transfer over to the 2020 year. After about a one-year wait, we finally got the update to the airport layout plan, and this is a document that lays out all the properties that are owned by the airport and any type of future development for the airport. Here's a, uh, I zoomed in on the east side of the airport where you can see the area that we have for future development. That's uh, an area that's big enough to accommodate maybe 20 more hangars. And so right now we're beginning to look on the west side for development. The west side of the airport will accommodate the future corporate hangars as well as the uh, larger single unit hangars. We're also looking at developing a taxiway Foxtrot extension that will uh, link up the corporate hangars to taxiway Alpha, and this will make the uh, traffic movements much easier on the airport. The taxiway Foxtrot extension is part of our 10-year capital improvement plan that will also include uh, updating the uh, or developing the taxi streets on the airport. Part of the 10-year uh, plan is also uh, opening up a gate six on the airport, and this will allow the corporate customers to uh, enter and exit the airport from a, a much more convenient area off of Michigan Avenue. Mom, yes. I could ask a question about that. Yes, sir. Uh, FAA wanted that closed, and MDOT wanted it closed due to the left turn onto a uh, busy street. Um, is there discussion with MDOT then to completely realign the way uh, Woodville Road then aligns with uh, Michigan Avenue? Not yet. This is uh, the first step was to put a stop to the railroad crossing removal. So we have the option of having a gate six in the future. And if that ends up being a, uh, a point of conversation, then we'll, we'll go ahead with that. 
But for right now, I wanted to put a stop to the removal of the crossing because it, once the uh, railroad crossing gets removed, then there's no, uh, no future for that gate at all. But no, we have not started conversations yet. Because there was an issue with the railroad crossing also with hang-ups and the fact that uh, bringing it to grade was going to bring it into um, view uh, on the uh, problems with uh, site views with the airport itself and the west end of the airport. Okay, and, and that may have been a, a bigger issue with the old runway, the runway 624. I'm not sure that uh, the railroad is as much of a obstruction issue well, anymore. It was vehicles crossing. Vehicles crossing. Okay. Yes, sir. That's something that needs to be looked at then closer. I was not aware of any of those issues until now. So I appreciate that. So uh, basically, if we have the option of developing gate six, that's something that will be developed in the next 10 years. And, uh, but we'll have a lot, of, a lot more homework on that one to do. Another thing that we've done, uh, Hager 204 in the middle, right there in the photo, is a 1960s vintage hangar that is needing tremendous amounts of maintenance. At the same time, the, the individual that is renting the hangar from the county just purchased a new jet that no longer fits in the hangar. And uh, he basically came to us and said, look, if I can take over the hangar, I can redesign it, redevelop it, make it higher and bigger, and I can fit my jet in there. If I can't do it, I'm going to have to relocate to another airport. And so uh, we went ahead and we're, uh, we're trying out a private-public partnership where the individual gets a 20-year lease. He's uh, required to spend a minimum of $250,000 within the first 12 months to uh, fix, update, and develop the hangar. And at the end of 20 years, the hangar reverts back to the county. So this should be a showpiece hangar from the, uh, the conversations that we've had in, with the individual. And, uh, and it'll be a good way for us to see if uh, maybe a private-public partnership will work in the future developing additional hangar construction on the west side. Well, and without naming the person, it's a local uh, business owner, is it not? Yes, it's a uh, local business owner that has several uh, businesses in town, but his family has now uh, relocated to California. So he's basically uh, commuting back and forth to uh, operate his businesses. We don't want to lose an individual like that to the county. And the, uh, the latest update on the uh, restaurant sale, we're hoping that by the end of this month, early October, the new owner will be, uh, will be approved and the sale will be completed. His name is Anthony Riddle. He's a local Jackson person. He grew up in Jackson joined the Marine Corps for uh, 13 years. He's highly decorated, and now he wants to uh, give the restaurant business a try. He's got a, a lot of great ideas. He's going to extend the hours to uh, 11 o'clock weekdays, and he's uh, working on developing an, a, uh, a patio for next year. So when, when the apron for the uh, airport is redone next year, Part of the project is going to shift the whole apron 25 feet away from the terminal building. That will give us additional space to have a patio for the restaurant. A lot of the customers keep telling us that they want to be able to go outside and eat while they're watching the airplanes. So we're hope, hopeful that uh, this will work through for us. Any uh, questions? Commissioners, any questions of one? None. Thanks, one. Thank you. Take us down to the Region 2 Planning Commission's semi-annual report. Grant, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. We have a hour and a half worth of reading there, but you can probably hit the highlights, huh? Yes, I will try. Okay. Uh, the uh, Region 2 Planning Commission continues to provide a variety of services to the county. Uh, we staff the county's planning commission, uh, which uh, met monthly in the first half of the year, uh, looked at uh, and made recommendations on 23 cases. The planning commission has the responsibility per the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act to uh, provide recommendations uh, before the 
before township boards take final action on any amendments to township zoning ordinances. 16 uh, of those reviews were, were provided, um, uh, divided equally between rezonings and uh, text amendments. Uh, per the uh, Michigan Department of Agriculture and their uh, PA 116 farmland and open space uh, uh, <coughs> program, uh, uh, those applications come through uh, for review by the County Planning Commission and three of those were provided. And then per the Michigan Planning and Enabling Act, um, we have the responsibility of reviewing uh, master plans before they are adopted by the Planning Commission uh, and by, by, by the local planning commissions and four of those were, were, were done in the first six months. Uh, we also uh, began work on the countywide uh, master plan in which a, the community description and issue identification chapter um, was, was put together, uh, which includes uh, 23 maps, uh, a demographic uh, summary, and other information. Uh, we provide a, a variety of transportation planning services to the county. Uh, the work on the I-94 um, Cooper Street interchange uh, through the Federal Highway Administration, those funds um, are, are, are funneled through uh, the uh, federally mandated um, process uh, uh, locally um, that is uh, uh, staffed by, by Region 2. Uh, there is the uh, West Avenue interchange uh, that has been designed. Uh, one of the attachments to the report shows uh, the, the, the design that's currently been um, selected uh, uh, by MDOT for, uh, for, for the reconstruction of, of that interchange. Um, we're also um, uh, <coughs> partnering with uh, uh, Region 2 uh, and the city as well as the county on a city county um, non-motorized plan uh, that was kicked off uh, earlier this year. There have been a couple of steering committees. Uh, a project website has been set up. Uh, in um, May there were a series of public outreach um, meetings at which over a hundred people uh, attended and there were um, 80 additional people that uh, that uh, commented uh, through through the website. So we're getting a lot of good uh, public comment on that. Uh, uh, this week and next week are the, are, are the second um, round of public workshops. And so I encourage um, all of you to uh, attend one of those if you're uh, able to, um, as, as a citizen, to, uh, to, to look at the uh, preliminary uh, non-motorized network that, that came out of uh, those, those original meetings. Uh, we continue to uh, administer the uh, transportation improvement program uh, in which um, all projects that are going to receive that federal funding through the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration, uh, the, the projects need to be listed on, uh, on that tip. Um, and uh, uh, the, the new tip for um, 2020 through 2023 was put together, and then we're still administering the, uh, the, the existing tip, which began in 2017. Uh, Monies that come through Federal Highway Administration are split up between um, urban funds and uh, rural funds. The urban funds go solely through the Jackson Area Comprehensive Transportation Study, but the rural funds are administered by the three county uh, rural uh, task force. And so those projects uh, were, were also um, went through that, that process. Uh, asset management report um, for 27-2018 um, was finalized, which looks at the condition of federal aid eligible roadways within the county. And uh, we discovered in that that 16% of the uh, miles of, of road were in very good or excellent condition. 39% were in fair or good condition, and unfortunately, 45% were in poor or very poor condition. Um, and uh, one of the uh, attachments to the staff report uh, provides more, more detail on, on that. Uh, 
We are also looking, uh, we've also helped to facilitate a, a variety of non-motorized projects um, within uh, the county. Uh, there's going to be a feasibility study to extend the Falling Waters Trail from, uh, <clears throat> from, from Concord um, West to the Calhoun County line. Uh, there is a uh, possible trail um, proposed between uh, Brooklyn and Manchester uh, through the uh, Watkins Lake State Park that um, has interest at the state and the federal um, level given that uh, there was underground railroad uh, activity on that in the years leading up to the Civil War. Um, and then uh, we also participate on the Act of Jackson Committee and in that capacity um, commented on a city sidewalk survey within the city of Jackson. Services to Jackson County Parks include uh, um, helping them put together an update to their to the countywide recreation plan, which keeps the county eligible for uh, to apply for funding through the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund. Um, and uh, uh, in that capacity, uh, surveys were put together uh, for uh, the general public um, and also one for local governments and uh, draft chapters and appendices of that plan were, were, also, were also looked at. And for this year, uh, the Jackson County Parks put together uh, grant applications for the trust fund for Vandercook Lake uh, and Wolf Lake County Parks and um, letters of support were drafted and uh, approved for submittal through the uh, Jackson County Planning Commission on that. Economic development work includes uh, the Regional Prosperity Initiative, which is a six county area, which includes uh, uh, Hillsdale, Jackson, and Lenaway, as well as, uh, as as well as Monroe, Washtenaw, and Livingston counties to to the east. Uh, in which $140,000 in pass through funds for the from the state were uh, reissued in uh, challenge grants um, for economic development purposes. And then there were also uh, a variety of things that were done um, through the Economic Development Administration. Um, other miscellaneous services that were provided by Region 2 is participation on um, the Upper Grand River Watershed Alliance's um, stormwater and water trail planning committees. Uh, we also participated in March and April in the workshops for the county's strategic plan. And we also met in March with the intern in the county administrator's office and explained uh, to him uh, what planning services uh, we provide. Uh, that pretty much sums up um, what we did in the first six months. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Commissioners, any questions of Grant, uh, including of the attached documents with the report? Okay. Hearing none, thank you, Grant. Thank you very much. Takes us to the 911 AT&T lease agreement on the Henrietta Tower. Director Hammond, good morning. Good morning. Uh, what I have before you guys is a um, motion to request the approval of signing of a lease agreement with AT&T FirstNet to lease the available space on our communication tower out in Henrietta Township. Um, An authorization of Chairman Shotwell to sign the lease. A little bit about the background. Earlier this year, we went to the 800 megahertz system, leaving our VHF system um, empty. So we had a, about seven towers, but we actually only owned two towers. One was on the property of Henrietta, and one was on Clark Lake. Um, there was a need to try to either sell the towers, lease the towers to sell carriers. So I found out that uh, FirstNet, which is AT&T, was looking for space in Jackson County. One of the spaces was in Henrietta. They needed the uh, uh, the coverage. Uh, efforts have been underway to rent out the towers, but only AT&T is the only ones that have came um, forth to asking to lease it. Um, uh, AT&T FirstNet is a 
broadband network for all public safety nationwide, 50 states, 53 ter uh, five U.S. territories in the District of Columbia. This was given to them about two years ago, about $56 billion to, up to build out this um, network. We used uh, Robert Townsend, Attorney Colton Stoker, and Toski. Um, during this process of the contract, the contract started about six months ago, and they were finally able to reach a uh, agreement between the two uh, a couple weeks ago. In order to research fair and equitable rate for the lease, we contacted other counties to see the going rate, rate was for renting the space on the tower. Based on that information, the recommendation from Mr. Townsend, we believe the rate fair for the Jackson County was fair. Um, the communication and negotiations have been ongoing with AT&T to develop a lease agreement with for space on that tower in Henrietta. Uh, the location of the tower and the height of the available space to rent are desirable for AT&T FirstNet. Uh, AT&T FirstNet has agreed to a five-year initial term at $1,400 per month. Uh, there's also the yearly with automatic renewal of four additional five-year terms with each renewal, renewal of five years, Jackson County will receive a 10% increase. If requested by AT&T, uh, first that the additional uh, more rad space, so more antennas on the tower is what that covers. Um, it will cost, increase the rent by $250 per month per the contract. Also, if more ground space is needed, it will increase the rent by $1 per square foot. Any modifications of the tower for the increase of rad space or more antennas will be at the sole cost of AT&T with a structural analysis to go along with that. Structural analysis determines if the tower can hold it. If it can't hold it, the modifications have to be done by AT&T. AT&T has completed a structural analysis of the Henry Tower back in February. I asked him to do it to, to begin the, if, if it's possible, even to put their equipment on that tower, which they did. Per the contract, Jackson County will be responsible for regular maintenance of the tower. Based on analysis of the tower, there is not expected to be any regular maintenance for this tower in the foreseeable future, as the tower is in good shape. In addition, the revenue from the lease is expected to be more then sufficiently cover any regular maintenance that would be expected over the length of the lease. This enhancement will cover, will, will continue to increase the coverage and reliability of AT&T FirstNet, as well as provide a secondary form of communication to Jackson County in the event of a major disaster. The enhancement will also provide better coverage for the citizens of Jackson County. This supports the strategic plan initiative of working cooperatively and collaboratively with other units of government. Um, the, a little bit about the first net: all public safety entities in Jackson County have the ability to have the ability for priority on this network if they subscribe to it. It's a private network only for public safety. Jackson County may exit the lease with a 30-day written notice before the renewal of 60 days or a 60 days written notice during this agreement. Jason, can I interject a question? Yes. The only thing that was bothersome to me or question that was hanging out there was uh, uh, what was called the regular maintenance of the existing tower. Is that laid out clearly in the contract itself, what we're responsible for and what they are, number one? Number two, do we have to provide power to them? Are they paying for that or are we? And backup generation, is that on us or on them? So the backup generator is on them. That's for their, their building. Um, the regular maintenance would include, if, if, the, if the tower was painted, we'd have to paint it probably every 15 to 20 years. That tower is not painted. 
Um, we'd have to do a structural analysis. Every 10 years, we, we should do one anyways, and that's what we do right now um, with our current uh, uh, towers. Um, and then if it was if it was lighted, we'd have to be uh, covered. We'd have to minus the, the light. With that light, it's under 200 feet. So we there's no light for that one either. Okay, commissioners, any other <clears throat> questions from any of you? And if not, I think a motion's in order. Tony? Motion and support. Questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Next up, it takes us to the quickest part of the agenda, JC. Dot. Good morning. Was that a subliminal slip in there? The quickest part? We'll do our best. One moment to get my item I, right? Underbody blades? you say okay this is pretty straightforward uh, you've seen these bids before an annual um, ritual for us as we plow snow we we go through blades on our plows um, we've explored various materials and um, the recommendation is before you for a hundred and thirty two thousand six hundred seventy five dollars commissioners any questions on the underbody blades and if not we'd be looking for a motion Corey, you raising your hand? Yeah, just clarification. I know we have the agreement with Calhoun County, and I see that some members from their road department met with you. Um, are they going to have access to these, uh, use, using them? No. What we do is we pool our bids together, so they have a certain allocation that they've stipulated in the, uh, uh, the proposal solicitation, and these are ours. This is our amount. Okay. Yeah. Th thanks. We tend to get better prices. It's working very well. It's one of the huge success stories of our partnership with Callum. Tony? Motion and support. Questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Chris, signs and posts. This is, uh, again, an annual uh, bidding that we do to make sure we're getting the best prices on signs. We do make uh, some signs ourselves with our sign shop. Uh, we have a talented crew that uh, takes care of that. But uh, we do purchase where it makes economical sense to do so. And you'll see in the bid tab there's quite a long list of uh, various signs that we purchase and keep in inventory. This also includes the sign posts, which are galvanized steel. So we're seeking... Uh, a blessing on the hundred fifty thousand dollars per year. Commissioners, questions or comments of Chris? If not, a motion's in order. Goes to the full board. Phil. Chris, does the prison system still make any of the signs? I uh, believe we get recycled blanks from them, um, but I don't. I don't know if they do anymore. I can double check. If so, we'd, we'd be interested in following through with uh, some kind of an arrangement with them. Okay. If there's I'll no check. more questions, a motion's in order. Motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Plateau Drive Culvert, Chris. I'll have Angie take care of that one. Do you have it up? Uh, no, but I can get it for you. There you go. And just look forward as you see fit. All right. I'll go this way. Good morning. So the Plateau Drive culvert is a culvert that um, we found when we were out doing the Summit Township repairs for their complete streets program. And we need to replace it, so we put a bid out, um, had two contractors bid, and we're looking to award it to, I forgot, Concord, thank you. 
Um, and per our policy, culverts over th with this size, this is a s approximately a six foot by four foot um, squashed culvert or elliptical culvert. So this would require a 50% match with the township. So that's why it's not being done on the road project. It was bid separate. So it's a clean cut billing for the township. So if, is there any questions? Tony. It is. Just to clarify, it's 41,553. Yes. And we had a motion and a support, I believe, correct? Yes, All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Thank you. MTF bond resolution. Thank you. Uh, I'm at the committee's pleasure as to whether you'd like me to go through the presentation again. I'm not sure if there's anybody new here today. I, I should have prefaced the introduction on item L with the fact that we had a study session. Uh, very thorough presentation. Um, I did have conversations with one commissioner that wasn't there and ran it down to him as best I could. But any commissioners that have any questions of Chris, and of course this would get forwarded onto the full board. Uh, so if you have questions of Chris that you need answered, feel free to ask. And if not, then we'd be looking for a motion to send it on to the full board. Motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Northwest Elementary traffic signal. Chris. Thank you. Uh, again, I'll have Angie uh, give an update on this one. All right, so we've been working with the school um, for their traffic flow issues that they have. Uh, we met out with the commissioner a couple times and looked at it. And since their new construction of their uh, early elementary building, um, at the times of school starting and getting out, they have an extreme backflow on their property. Um, with the Lansing Ave uh, signal shortly or just to the east, just down Lansing and Parnell, south, sorry. Um, and the timing there, it, they back up. So we've been working with them, looking at different situations to help improve that. And we've gotten some costs from J-Rank to install a signal there. It'll be a permanent signal, um, a box span. So they'll have the four poles. It's the, the modernized type signal. Not mast arms, though I want to clarify. It's just the, the wood poles that they'll be hung on the box spans wires. Um, and right now we're proposing, it's got the full amount in here because we have to pay it out to J-Rank, but then we are working with the school and the township to be reimbursed up to 50% of the cost of installation for this signal. Any questions? I've just got two. Uh, one, was there discussion about also adding left turn lights at Lansing and Parnell is that part of this project or not part of it so the Lansing and Parnell signal was submitted for a safety grant um, this year so we'll find out anywhere from late November to February is the range that we find out about those safety grants but with that grant we submitted to modernize that and add left turn phases and um, possibly a right turn lane if needed uh, and pedestrian signals. So oh. we're trying to tie that all together. Great. Uh, I'll also comment I appreciate Chris and uh, Angie and the staff coming out. We were out there probably a year ago, I think, and I have gone in and out of there frequently, and it's a mess. <laughs> uh, and that's because they're busting at the seams. So is uh, there clear agreement from the school district or the township about their cost share? I mean, no argument about that? or. Mm. When we met with them last week, the school was on board, um, and the township was, so it was the officer, um, what's his last name? Uh, the chief. Yeah. Jester. Okay. Um, that was there, and he was going to take it back and talk to the township and see if there was support and then communicate with the schools. I have not heard anything back that it's a no-go, so I'm assuming that they are good with sharing that 50%. It's a verbal. But it's a verbal commitment at this point. And you're looking at probably the school and the township splitting that 50%, right? Is there any argument to be made that it should be fully on JDOT? 
with it being a county road or not? Uh, we did a, a model of this, and our level of service is good on, on Lansing. It is purely the driveway coming out of there. So in a typical situation, if this was a private development, we would require them to do that modeling and to pay 100% to install that. So we're proposing the 50% because it is a school and partnering with them. Okay, so last question from me then. I think we're authorized up to 50000 at committee. Is it? Okay, so we're good then. Okay, any questions from the other commissioners? Tony. It does not. That's why I ask about the amount. It gets approved here at this level. It's currently not given us a written consent for their financial contribution if that if the township decides no uh, what are the financial consequences of that decision by the township um, I would okay. well yeah Tony I, I think we are going to approve this based on the fact that we're paying for half right. somebody else is paying for half correct with that condition. if that doesn't happen then right. it doesn't happen right with that condition in your motion yeah Okay, any other questions? So we'd be looking for a motion to approve it uh, contingent on the fact that the county is paying for half and the other 50% will be as has been worked out, I guess, by JC Debt. Okay. Motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you for your work on it, Angie. Uh, Hydra Dig. I've prepared a uh, vi uh, picture's worth a thousand words, so I've prepared a uh, supplementary, if I can find it here, presentation, which is in board docs for you. This is something I've been researching for, uh, I think, over three years, but at the time that I first discovered the machinery and we were talking among staff about it, it wasn't available in the United States. But these machines are common in Europe, and we're, we're delighted that they finally are available here and that uh, AIS out of Lansing is the regional dealership for these. So if I can advance carefully, here we go. I'll just give you a quick overview of how this is truly a Swiss Army jackknife machine. It's a term I use quite a bit. I'm sorry about that, but it's just so true. Uh, this is probably the one of uh, three quintessential machines that every county road agency should own. And uh, it's amazing what the technology can do. So just a quick overview here. First of all, the boom arm is articulated and has quite a reach and you can put any kind of mowing uh, apparatus at the end of the boom. Uh, you can use a flail motor, a rotary cutter, even a forestry head. So you can mow close to the road or far from the road. And the driver, as you see, is perpendicular. He has clear visibility looking at what he's mowing for safety reasons. And the machine can be moving sideways down the road. Uh, and he can also rotate to drive uh, forward. Here again is mowing. The boom is a little more pulled in to get the fore slope of the ditch. We have uh, tractors with the boom mowers that work very well for this as well. But uh, uh, this would probably work in tandem with that so we could do uh, multiple layers of a road in one shot. This machine could be going either behind or ahead of the tractor and they could both be uh, working to get a, a stretch of roadway done much quicker. We're coming up on winter. You might be wondering why are we bringing this right now. Um, one of our hopes is to get get these in action as we head into winter so that on mild winter days we can be brushing. Uh, we've got, if you drive around our county roads, you've noticed that we've got a lot of brush issues. We had the heavy rain earlier in the season and then the warm season hit and things just grew like crazy. So uh, the grabber, uh, um, these are quick tatch by the way. The operator from the cab without getting out can decouple and then reattach something. Uh, minus of course the hydraulic hose connections that might be needed. But for buckets and other simple items they can detach and attach from the cab. It works as a multi-purpose crane. There are many times we need to be lowering a culvert in or doing other things. You'll see here a trailer attached. It has towing capabilities. 
this is powerful for emergency response and just general um, uh, efficiencies. Normally, we'd have to have a driver take a dump truck out and another driver take a backhoe out. Here, one driver can take some of the basic tools and attachments they need in the trailer to the job site and uh, potentially work alone, uh, of course, with flaggers if needed. Forklift, attachment, yes. Correct. It, it travels down the road. It has ride control. So much like our loaders will go out in the middle of the night to take trees off the road when they're called in by 911, these units uh, will do the same. And uh, so it's kind of a supplement to in our emergency response efforts as well. But they, they truck down the road. They have a hydrostatic drive at a good 25 miles an hour, which is, which is great. So that forklift, by the way, it, it, one of the secrets to the machine that makes it amazing is the steel wrist. The red and gray that you see there rotates around like this. So a traditional excavator only moves this direction and can only go perpendicular to the boom. But this one can move any way you want. So if you're coming in at an angle and you want to put a pallet in, you can turn it. That wrist will move. So it's a very nice feature. Site restoration, you see here a wide bucket for uh, smoothing material out and placing it. Uh, we, of course, need that in, in a lot of our road projects that we're doing um, throughout the county. That's a wide bucket. There's narrow bucket options. Here you see that, that wrist uh, turning the bucket so the operator can stay stationed but sweep the bucket going sideways with material. Uh, which greatly enhances efficiency, and it's something our traditional excavators can't easily do. He would have to maneuver around and pull towards or away from him or her uh, with the traditional machines. Here's a compactor uh, working, uh, excuse me, that's the bucket, but you can attach a compactor to handle um, four slope restoration, backfill around culverts and so forth with a vibratory plate. So it's a, a very powerful feature. And here you see just general excavation for placement of uh, culverts and pipes um, and so forth. It works as a traditional machine. And I like this picture on the right because it shows the, the uh, crab steering. It has a variety of steering, so you could literally rotate around in a circle. Um, it's a very tight radius, so it, it maneuvers um, very nicely and you can stay within one lane of traffic. You can see the hangover of the back, the tail, uh, is very tight, so it doesn't take up two lanes of traffic. Our great all when it goes out, is a very large machine, and it has a large tail that hangs out over the other lane of traffic. So we sometimes have to close both lanes and have extra flagging to make sure that uh, traffic doesn't, doesn't uh, hit that. Here you see ditching and drainage maintenance happening. You, you see here that the bucket is turned, that steel wrist is turned to move that material. And a, a dump truck could be sitting in the foreground here. He could scoop that up, rotate around, and drop it in the dump truck to haul away. This, you can't quite see through the weeds, but it's a very long, like a 12 foot long rake attachment. So we could work in partnership with the drain commissioner to help with uh, ditch maintenance. Um, the machine is all terrain. And uh, in fact, uh, forestry companies use it for forestry work and also uh, like forestry road maintenance in their operations as well. Chris? Yes. Are you buying all the attachments that go on this? Our proposal includes some of the basics. I think there are four attachments included, the buckets and uh, a mower. We will continue to explore other enhancements in the future. We just weren't ready to bring all of that today. So, and relative to the cost of the machine itself, the, the attachments are, are not quite as expensive. But we want to have the arsenal of, of tools to put on the machine. Did that answer your question? Yeah, because I'm looking at the ad right now online, and the, the ditch mower that's done submersible for, for wet areas. I'm, I can think of three areas we have right now that water crosses the road in the springtime where a proper cleaning probably would absolutely work very well and at this time all we have is just traditional buckets for that kind of work but huh? 
that rake machine, this here, it has cutting teeth on it. So as it's pulling, it it, it trims the uh, vegetation and so forth and, and brush as it's pulling. You can see how clean the ditch is in the background as it's moving forward. Uh, the towing is amazing. Uh, with this, you can pull, uh, I think, almost up to um, four tons. Um, they make a dump trailer. So one driver, again, can take all the attachments they would need for a project, throw in a culvert uh, and other items they might need, and uh, head out. Much more effective and efficient. Any backfill material or topsoil they would need for the project, uh, and any debris that they come up with, they could put in that trailer and take it back to the yard with them and just tow it back. You also see the machine has a push blade on it. So for backfill and, and other things, it's very handy. So our attachments yet are, are to be researched, but we wanted to give you kind of an overview of what this machine does, how amazing it is. And uh, one of the machines in our proposal here is dedicated to the state crews, so it would be fully reimbursed by MDOT. And that machine we're looking to put a a post driver on. So our state crews go out and repair guardrails all the time. One of the things we currently don't have is a machine to drive posts in for those guardrails. So they make a wonderful attachment for this. Uh, this machine is basically one giant hydraulic pump. So it has high flow hydraulics that would connect to the post driver and just vibrate the post in one at a time very quickly. So uh, in talking with our director of operations, Bob Holbert, he's very excited about that uh, new tool, which again is fully reimbursed by our state contract. Chris, I've got a couple of questions for you if I could. Yes. Uh, knowing that you're buying four of these, you could actually split up what attachments you get, could you not? They just we could. Yeah, we don't Some need of the more unique ones anyway. Correct. Yeah. Um, we do envision that mowing, each one would need a mower because we'd want to hit it um, at the same time and be out. But, but yes. you wouldn't need to get four of everything when you get to the unique attachments anyway. Correct. They did would I, just go in a general collection. Right? Did I hear you say the max speed is 25 miles per hour? Is that what you Yeah, said? that's what we're told from the manufacturer. And the plan is to have four of these, so one at each county garage, so they're kind of spread throughout the county? Right. We may collapse them to do, like when we're doing some uh, brushing trimming, we might pull two or three of them in and work down that road and get it done. Uh, we think it'll go very fast. And then the plan is, uh, assuming that the bond proposal gets approved, this would qualify for payment through that, correct? Correct. Because you can go back 60 days, I think you said. Or, That's right. Uh, you're buying them through my deal, or if they're bought, they go through my deal, plus you got a 3% discount on top of that because of the quantity? Correct. Uh, we originally were just looking at getting one, and then we, we asked the question, what if we, because we wanted eventually four, uh, what could they do? And they sharpened their pencils and came back with a pretty big discount, in our opinion, a pretty big discount to buy four at once. And they think they're available within about 60 to, to 90 days, so we should have them in December. Okay. That's it for me, Commissioners. Phil? Chris, in the past, the JCB machines have had a history of slow delivery of repair parts hmm. they're shipped over from I believe England isn't it yeah exactly we think um, we work with AIS out of Lansing and one of their um, their key philosophies in their business operation is uh, stocking routine parts uh, we found with the work in machinery that once in a while we'll have to wait for shipment of a part but Wirtgen, in that case, uh, is very good about air shipping. They'll even rob something off the yard, if necessary, off a new machine and, and send it, if necessary. But they generally have a huge warehouse in Nashville and send us things. So my understanding is JCB, JCB has a United States center now, and the parts should be free-flowing okay. at this point. And it's got so many unique and specialty parts. Right. Uh, that, the delivery of those things would concern me a bit. Also, do you have any example of a cost of a a, a uh, one of the adapters to especially like the mower or the post hole digger or, or the attachments right uh, or, I mean what are we talking here as far as costs on attachments well it generally ranges between 10 and 30,000 depending on what the unit is uh, a lot of vendors are starting to make these attachments and um, there are quite a few reviews. We're still in the process of vetting and reviewing those. Um, we like to buy quality, um, quality machinery, of course, but we're, we're encouraged by what we see. Okay. And so that's a ballpark number. All right. So you well, may see I us come back for approvals on those. Delivery. I mean, they're a pretty good unit from what I've heard, but 
right. parts, I mean JCB, not this particular one, I don't know anything about it, but parts delivery used to be a problem. Right. All right, thank you. Yeah, we've been assured by our dealership that they would they would bend over backwards to help us out, so we have a great deal of confidence in them. Okay, thank you, sir. Other questions? Tony? So your current proposal is for four hydro digs and includes attachments for grading, excavating, mowing, and forks for moving material. Is that four of each of those attachments? Correct. Each unit would come with those. And those are kind of the common attachments that we feel each machine should have. Each garage should have those basics. We may only need one or two forestry heads. Uh, we may only need uh, uh, one post hole digger and so forth. We're still evaluating what makes sense. We like to start slow and then add if necessary, but uh, one okay. postal digger is obvious, Thank for example. Okay, if Darius. Just one quick question. Um, with the attachments that we uh, that we may purchase, would the warranty cover any of those? Yeah, <clears throat> my understanding is yes. It's a complete package. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nothing for we don't expect case. problems with them. The mower would be the one that we would worry about the most. The others are basically fixed steel items, buckets and forks. So. This does include the steel wrist, that rotating piece, which is very important. You don't have to buy that. In some applications, you don't want it, but in, we would like that, obviously. That's what gives it so much versatility. Okay. Looking for a motion to send it to the full board. The amount is nine ninety five eighty three and 48 cents. Motion and support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Bio Restore Asphalt Rejuvenator, which sounds better than the other one. Yeah, I think I accidentally closed the uh, board docs, Deborah. Is there some magic that I need to do? Or, or you got it. You're taking over. I appreciate that, Nathan. All right. So, um... I have affectionately called this BioRestore product a road lotion or the family of products because it's much like a moisturizer for your skin in the sense that uh, chip seal would coat the roads and then apply chips for a friction surface. It's, it's a little bit like a paint. It's intended to seal the cracks in the surface of the asphalt. This is different. <clears throat> this is sprayed on at a, at a very carefully calibrated application rate and soaks into the uh, asphalt about one and a half inches or so into the asphalt and if the road is too old it's too late so you want to hit it within one or two years maybe three years to try to moisturize that asphalt so to speak it, it has a chemical very complicated I'm happy to sit down and explain it to anyone who's interested but it actually restores some of the the properties that are in the initial asphalt uh, when it's first put down that makes it soft and flexible and so through that uh, process, you see in the brochure, there's the 13 years of bio-based road ROI there. Um, and it shows one lane of traffic on the right in the photo, and the other lane of traffic was not treated. And this was done in Ohio at Dark County, a very compelling test. And of course, uh, you know me by now, I had to see it for myself. And I found out that Cass County, uh, I used to work there, and we had talked about this before before I came to Jackson. They did follow through, so back in uh, 2014, they did apply it to a stretch of road. They didn't do it on the lane basis. They had a mile of road that they didn't do it, and then they started it. And uh, the the contrast is, is uh, amazing. Uh, cracks everywhere, and then just suddenly at that intersection, it looks much like you see here. The asphalt grays and oxidizes, but it stays very flexible, and there were minimal, if any, cracks uh, on the uh, several miles stretch of roadway. So what we're looking to do, we have an attractive pricing option here from the company, and they're willing to throw in the spray apparatus. Um, the cost is much more effective if we spray it ourselves. So again, the sprayer is complimentary. If we buy the truckload, it's basically for freight reasons, we wanted to get a truckload. And so that cost of 260000 dollars would do 40, 40 miles of road and we're looking to basically get 40 miles down before winter and that way we can start monitoring and seeing how this stuff holds up 
we're optimistic. But we feel we need an alternative to chip seal in, in especially our subdivisions and so forth. Chris, in your three-page explanation of it, you've got the recommendation by my reading of it to buy it by the tote, correct? Correct. But doesn't it make more sense to buy it by the truckload? It is the truckload, actually. It's just that the they, they sell it in totes. So uh, this, this volume of totes fills up a, a flatbed truck, essentially, if that makes sense. So you're saving the eight bucks per gallon then by buying it this way? Correct. Essentially, which yes. is 41 grand. And yep. you're getting the 11 grand worth of equipment to apply it as well? Right. Is there a uh, expiration date per se on the stuff? I mean, it's going to be sitting around for how long? We asked that question, and we didn't have any concerns. Do you remember, Angie? Don't remember, but we plan on applying it this year. Yeah, we can't let it freeze in the totes. We, we plan to put it down. That's why we're bringing it to you now. Yeah. We want to get it down here in the next month, month and a half, if we can. Okay. Commissioners, any questions of the proposal? goes to the full board if we approve it. We have a motion from Phil. Is there a support? support. Okay. Support from Darius. Question. Go right ahead, Tony. Um, this two hundred sixty thousand dollars plus tote deposit and shipping. Any idea what the shipping is? Um, at the time we wrote this, we were still investigating the cost of shipping. It'd be standard uh, freight rates for flatbed trucking. Um, I can follow up with that for you by email. We don't have a number yet. Is the short answer. You can have that by our next meeting, I bet. Yeah. Okay. okay. That'd be good. Thank you. Yeah. Bill. What, what, what type of apparatus is it self propelled that w this is applied with, or a trailer with a sprayer attached? Oh. It's basically we would use one of our one tons with the tote on the flatbed, and it's mixed with water, uh, so it'd be mounted on the rear of a, a one ton um, heavy duty truck, uh, pickup truck, right, essentially. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we have a motion and support. Any other questions? Rodney. How does that come? Is it is it in a pellet form? No, it's a liquid. It a is a concentrated liquid. liquid that we then have to dilute, right? You know what the reduction ratio is offhand? No? Okay. We mix it. Mix it and dilute it. Is it made out of soybeans? Yeah, basically, yes. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. All those in favor of sending this to the full board, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same. Motion carried. Takes us down to the monthly report. Mr. Chairman, can I say one more thing about the bio store? No. You don't mind? No? Yes, okay. go ahead. <laughs> uh, we did carefully review white papers and studies on this. There have been a few comparison studies, and this was the leading product in all cases. Minnesota had very good luck with it. Um, and of course, you saw the photos of the study in Ohio. I just wanted to highlight, uh, thank you for moving this to the full board. It, it's one of our innovations that we'll be real proud to share with the rest of the state as, as a pilot project. So we're hopeful that we'll get positive results. Thank you. Monthly report. To let commissioners know if you go to their website, there are videos and how it goes down, the equipment, and everything available, full presentation if you like to look at it and just finish looking at the process. Uh, it's 20 minutes to a half hour after you apply it that you could just open it back up to traffic, by the way. So it's a translucent project product, goes down and it doesn't turn the asphalt black. We would love it if it did because it's good for public perception, but it does its magic uh, with kind of a transparent uh, coloration so the asphalt will still gray over time. Well, you have the monthly report before you. Um, happy to take any questions on that. I don't really have too much to add, um, minus your questions, of course. Chris, I've only got one that's got to be a Freudian slip about our pothole patching machine. Okay. I think you have in the presentation that it's been repaired and repaired. 
repaired and repaired? Yeah. Right. Well, that is true. <laughs> so it wasn't a Freudian It's not really a typo, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> under warranty, it has been uh, upgraded, and, and it is, the machine is back and ready to roll. We just don't have any potholes at the moment. Or we're not aware of any. If you know of some, let us know. But it is going to be, it, it, and uh, it will serve as our emergency response vehicle. So as calls roll in and as we discover, we have a new emphasis internally that we ourselves, our crews, report issues and potholes as they encounter them. So it's intended to, to head out each day and hit them as they roll in. So my dream is to have a 24-hour response on any called in pothole, 48 max. But and Chris, what's the warranty on that? Has the warranty been extended because we've had such problems with it or not? Well, I'm, I'm asking the company uh, to start it over as of now. And so uh, if they want to use us as a referral and a reference, I think it's essential that we pretend it was just delivered. Commissioners, any questions for the monthly report? Phil? Chris, I go to Norville Township in a couple of nights. Uh, anything, what, what's the latest on Norville Road? Andrew will be happy to answer a question on that. <laughs> um, I, I think I updated you guys on the strike for that one, so it was, it was stopped for a little bit, but they are back to work. Um, they have the base done on the entire project and over the next couple of weeks they'll get the leveling course and the top course done so um, I was in communications with our inspectors as of Friday and they're hoping uh, I don't want to put a time but they'll be done before the completion date is what they're telling us which is November 15th okay it's no longer gravel so we're just right. happy about that, that was a <sighs> okay they're gonna ask so yep. yeah thank you much you're welcome should be done this month, I think, is the short answer. I hope so. As long as Angie's right there. McDivitt? Um, the utilities are being relocated, and we are working with our consultant to get our first uh, phase bid package out. Should be here this month. Hit in the street. Yeah. Okay, commissioners, any other questions? Uh, Darius first, and then Tony. Um, if we could, I'm sorry, I know we passed it already and we've already approved it, but I was just wondering with the uh, component that we're adding to uh, to the grounds that we just we just approved there, is there something that we could add to the compound to give the roads more of a black look in the event that we spray it? Or would that mess with the... We asked. Okay. Um, they've been asked that. <laughs> and they don't have anything at this time. Okay. All right, thank you. That was all I had. So what we're thinking is get this, this product down um, it lasts about three to four years. So if we get it down to do the moisturizing and pre preservation, we're thinking of a, um, taking a mile or two of road in the following year, put kind of a black coating on. So get the material in, let it cure, and then coat it and see if we get kind of a, a stacking effect of, of ultra protection. So, yeah. It does, you're correct. It just looks like a wet road. But it doesn't impact traction? No. No. Okay. You almost, you don't know it's there. Well, when you use the word lotion, that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> Sorry. Tony? Maybe I shouldn't use lotion. It's absorbed. Yeah, it's absorbed. <coughs> Have you found, a, found out yet a Mer Meridian Road? Is that a county road or a state road? And what is the plans for, are there plans for painting the white side lines on the road? The center stripe has been paid, painted yellow. Meridian is a county road, um, and so that, I'll have to look into the fog lines, but typically in the past, uh, the local roads did not have fog lines, and that, I believe, is a local road. Actually, I know it's a local road, so that's why it never has had fog lines on it. Uh, last year was the first year that we started putting fog lines on locals, so we're phasing them in with our painting. Um, if it does not have them, then I'll look into it. I don't know the answer to why it doesn't at this point. Because um, that's in, is it Summit or Spring Arbor? But it was the part of Marina that was recently reconstructed. Yeah. It's I just got a call from a resident. They said that, particularly at night, it's hard to differentiate between the the dark new asphalt and the dark shoulder, and people have been 
wandered yes. off the pavement onto the shoulder inadvertently. Okay. And they were yeah. wondering if it we, was um, like sidelines were going to be painted. That's why we started implementing the fog lanes on the local roads because no matter what road you're driving on, it's hard to see the edge of the road if you don't have a, a fog lane or a white line there. So we last year we submitted quadrants for safety grants. So we put four different quadrants in for fog lines um, to have it covered as a safety grant. And we were awarded two, but it was not uh, the, it was on the eastern side, or I think, yeah, the east side of the county that we were awarded that. So you'll see those go out next year. That'll be a contract that goes out with as a federal aid project. But um, Spring Arbor and Summit were going to be painted with our painting on the project. So I'll have to look into why that didn't get painted. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, commissioners? Hearing no questions. Oh, can I add, we do have one more round, so we'll, we can add it to make sure it gets done this year before winter. One more round of painting will be done in October. Okay. We'll make sure it is. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you both. Thank you. That takes us down to claims. Need to pay the bills. Motion and support. Make sure you sign them if you haven't already, please. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed the same. Motion carried. Other minutes in the October reporting scheduler there takes us down to public comment. Any public comment? John Q. Citizen, any comments there, Mr. Price? Uh, I, I can see if you're educated, do y'all know how to uh, keep bacon from curling in the frying pan? <laughs> Seeing how you're not at the podium. <laughs> no. Uh, committee member comments. I just got one I had mentioned to Mike that uh, it's helpful when we get the quarterly reports or biannual reports to see the numbers, I think, from the prior years. And hopefully we can encourage department heads and elected officials to include those old numbers. We had several questions about prior year numbers that weren't there for a couple of the reports. So not looking to throw anybody under the bus, but hopefully we can and get that incorporated into our reports that we get so we can see that. Uh, Phil, did you have a comment? They are here. I brought them down myself. I am now. <laughs> uh, any other comments? We're adjourned.